Thank you everyone for joining us here today. We are really, really excited uh, to share this important and topical conversation about sustainable finance. In the spirit of multi-stakeholder collaborations, we are so very pleased to present this unique opportunity to learn more about key strategies from subject matter experts about how to finance your decarbonization projects at a preferred rate of cost of capital. This event is brought to you by Artemis Project, that is a collective of women-owned businesses in the mining and metals industry who deliver practical solutions that drive greater UN SDG contributions. Our interest in today's sessions is providing Canadian mining companies insight into the rapidly evolving world of sustainable finance. Today, we are so very pleased to welcome our friends from Enerpo Research Centre in St. Petersburg European University, Society Generale headquartered in Paris and Ocene Precious Metals headquartered in Paris with an operational office in Canada. Together, we unite visions championing the development of green financial instruments as a vehicle to make genuine change in mining and metals and advance energy efficiencies and the low carbon economy. Once again, thank you for joining us today. We know uh, you'll be very um, excited uh, at, at the content and the insights that are being shared. And without any further ado, I now hand it over to our moderator for today's sessions. Anna, over to you. Thank you very much, Heather. And uh, again, welcome uh, to this uh, webinar. And uh, we are welcoming our partners and all our uh, participants and uh, attendees and uh, it's a uh, good morning good afternoon and uh, dobry day uh, uh, so we have a multi uh, language participation from different countries so uh, but as a start like it will be nice if uh, our participants can just uh, add to their name uh, the location or a city that they are uh, uh, tuning in from, so we can see uh, what, how many locations we have. It's very diverse the audience that we have today. And uh, we're very happy that we're partnering with uh, uh, Energy Policy Research Center uh, of uh, European University at St. Petersburg. Uh, and uh, that uh, Enerco Research Center is a think tank uh, with a very strong focus on sustainable finance uh, uh, and uh, uh, re uh, renewable energy ESG policies. Uh, uh, so Enerco is also developing uh, training and educational programs uh, for uh, uh, industry participants and uh, financial institutions. Um, so uh, well, with a uh, with a great pleasure, I am now going to hand over uh, uh, the, the next 25-30 uh, minutes uh, of our airtime to uh, Maxim uh, Zitov and Olga Ziplova. So Maxim is uh, the uh, executive director of the NRCO uh, Research Center from 2016. His uh, leadership, his strong leadership is in uh, sustainable finance, uh, climate finance, uh, and uh, he worked uh, with the International Finance Corporation of World Bank uh, in uh, different regions like Middle East, North Africa, and uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, he is a graduate of the State uh, St. Petersburg University in a law, uh, so, and also has certificates from the um, uh, Cambridge University and INSET. So but over to you, Maxim, uh, and we're welcoming Maxim and Olga. Thank you, Anna, for this kind uh, introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today, and uh, we are uh, I would say trying to make a bridge between Russia and Canada today. And given the Russian uh, chairmanship in the Arctic Council, I think it's a very timely moment because uh, uh, under the, the Russian presidency, I learned, I, I read in the, in the official documents that a lot of attention will be 
uh, devoted to sustainability in, in the Arctic. So we are now discussing the mining industry and sustainable finance. I think it's a very, very important topic. So let me share with you our slides. Uh, and uh, I will start from uh, uh, describing what we do. Uh, as Anna just said, our three key pillars at the European University in our uh, research about energy policy and uh, international relations. First, we, we look uh, at uh, energy uh, politics and uh, how it is evolving uh, over time since uh, 2015, the establishment of our research center. Second uh, priority for us is uh, sustainable energy, climate change and sustainable development. Uh, by the way, I like how it sounds in French, développement durable. This is completely different from the, the English version and more poetic, I would say. Uh, and the third pillar for our research center is uh, sustainable finance. Uh, we produce uh, research, analytical uh, papers. Uh, we work with students. We prepare educational programs for students of our university and for corporate sector as well. And I have to admit that since January this year, we have a lot of requests from large Russian corporations uh, to train them on uh, ESG uh, factors. Why ESG is important? What shall we do? How shall we start? How to get better rating? And uh, so on and so forth. What is ESG finance? And so on and so forth. So I think uh, we contribute uh, to um, inform uh, Russian public and international colleagues uh, uh, about the situation in, in our country. This is uh, two examples of our recent uh, research. I would say it's two of our flagship uh, research papers. One, which is green, which is called uh, Responsible Finance Practices in Russian Banking uh, Industry. We did it uh, last year in 2020. Uh, together with Worldwide Fund for Russia and uh, Analytical Center of the Russian Rating Agency, we spoke with 25 top Russian banks, uh, asking them about uh, their vision about sustainability, their vision uh, of uh, potential uh, for creating special green financial products, uh, respecting uh, best practices, international standards for responsible finance, best principles of responsible finance. And we identified uh, some growing interest from Russian banks, and we proposed some uh, ways how to uh, raise awareness among other banks and help them to become greener and help them to launch special uh, green financial products. And the second document that you see on, on the left part of the screen is our uh, adaptation in Russia for the Russian market of the TCFD standards for uh, task force for climate related financial disclosure, the, the standards uh, uh, adopted by G20 and uh, Russian companies, especially mining companies and uh, energy companies uh, that are publicly listed uh, in Europe, uh, in London in particular, they are now having a lot of requests from international investors asking them to disclose information according to TCFC, TCD standards. That's why Russian companies are interested to learn more how to prepare for such a disclosure uh, and what exactly are best practices of such a disclosure. And this year, we also completed a series of uh, specific dedicated webinars about TCFD disclosure at the Moscow Stock Exchange. So we selected six different industries and prepare some guidelines and maybe Olga later can elaborate a little bit more about it. And uh, coming to uh, TCFD uh, agenda from the, the previous slide from our uh, Russian adaptation of this uh, document, uh, this is the framework for, for TCFD, which is based on four uh, key uh, milestones, I would say, uh, governance, uh, strategy, uh, risk management, and metrics and targets. So uh, the, the, the task force that were working on the standards, uh, they explained to us that when the company has to assess potential impact of climate change on its uh, business, on assets of the company, 
uh, they have to address all four uh, key uh, issues uh, together to make it systemic approach of uh, introducing TCSD standards for pay operations. Governance means that companies uh, setting uh, very uh, precisely roles, distributing roles, who is responsible for what. It's important that at the board level, at the management level, uh, you have a special committee or special person uh, responsible for uh, managing uh, climate risks and the climate opportunities. In terms of the strategy, uh, company has to identify risks and opportunities uh, and identify such risks and opportunities given different time horizons like short-term planning or long-term medium uh, time planning and explain in, in the document how these uh, um, impact strategic and financial planning. The third uh, part, which is risk management, uh, under this uh, part, the company has to prepare a process of managing identified risks and uh, opportunities, include this in the current risk management framework, and here climate risks be are becoming part of the general uh, approach to risk management. And finally, metrics and targets, the uh, company has to uh, uh, explain how precisely climate change will potentially impact uh, uh, its uh, operations, business and assets and uh, exposure to risks uh, is measured, targets should be set and the company has to explain how it will uh, see the progress and track this uh, progress over time. So this is the basic uh, part of the uh, TCFZ process. And uh, to start with the, the TCFZ approach, we should probably start, as I mentioned already, the Arctic. We should start from physical risks, as uh, later we will collaborate about other types of risks, like transition risk. And the climate change, climate related physical risks in the Arctic uh, is uh, underestimated, at least what we see currently in Russia, the perception is slightly changing, but still Arctic is perceived as something far from us, not in my backyard, and we don't really know what is happening, except companies that are doing business there, companies, especially mining sector, oil and gas sector, which is already affected by different uh, climate-related physical risks. And to be more precise, here you see three types uh, uh, you see uh, changes in bearing capacity of foundations on permafrost, which is a critical uh, aspect for the infrastructure, for buildings, for pipelines, oil and gas pipelines, for everything, basically. Uh, and uh, on the right side, you see a reduced operational lifespan of winter roads. And we spoke already with some mining companies that are preparing exploration of some um, uh, resources, natural resources in the Arctic, and they say, well, given the assessment uh, produced by Russian meteorological services uh, on the at the horizon of uh, 20, 25, 30 years, the temperatures in the Arctic are raising, and uh, there is a huge risk that uh, winter roads will be damaged severely by uh, melting permafrost and. Uh, we have to think about our logistics very carefully. Otherwise, it will cost us a fortune if we just uh, will not be able to use uh, existing winter roads. So the infrastructure assets are vulnerable to these uh, changes. And uh, uh, as, I, as I said, it may be a risk uh, of disruption of gas pipelines, other energy infrastructure, and uh, it may be a risk of cascading failure of the grid and uh, the lighting buildings and some other uh, critical issues. Uh, so here, I think um, I can pass uh, the microphone to Olga. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Maxim. And please, next slide. Yeah, okay, thank you. 
so uh, in my part, uh, in next, I would say, 15 minutes, I will try to walk you through the uh, main lessons learned uh, and basically what we realized and uh, what conclusions we made uh, during the, this project. And uh, I would like to focus um, on, the, on, the, on this particular slide uh, and to zoom in in into uh, you know transition risk because um, when we are talking about the mining sector we should not only consider uh, let's say direct emissions associated with mining transportation or production processes uh, but what is uh, also important is the scope free because nowadays um, rising expectations about uh, this disclosure scope free disclosures, uh, they force uh, producers to report um their own emissions and for uh, mining sector it is especially important because uh, they are the upstream uh, um, element yeah uh, for uh, many other sectors like automobile uh, producer of material building sectors and so on and so forth uh, there was um, a research that was released by uh, cdp and according to this research the upstream side of supply chain uh, my, yeah, and uh, mining is included into this part. Um, I would say that these uh, sectors are the, the lowest ratio of uh, supply chain emissions to direct emissions. Uh, they are really um, uh, I would say worry about uh, their scope-free emissions because uh, these sectors uh, they uh, contain large concentrations of the total emissions of the respective supply chains and therefore uh, the quality of disclosures and um, I would say emission reductions efforts on uh, like of this sector and of other sectors depend uh, to the great ex extent uh, on uh, mining and also so on oil and gas uh, and on um, utility, electric utility sector. So uh, that's important uh, to uh, keep in mind that uh, mining sector uh, is the, uh, the, like, uh, the first uh, element of the long uh, supply chain. And um, if uh, like uh, we are continuing with this slide uh, that um, TCFD is not only about uh, uh, risks, yeah, like physical and transition risks, but it's also about opportunities and uh, as you can see uh, the uh, green uh, so, uh, like icons uh, they uh, basically explain what are the main opportunities uh, that uh, mining sector can uh, use yeah it might be um, let's say uh, production uh, of the new metal uh, it might be uh, deployment of the renewable energy uh, resource efficiency uh, definitely is uh, part of uh, the sustainability solutions almost for every sector and uh, we can also talk about recycling uh, but here I think it's uh, worth noting uh, that uh, mainly uh, recycling steel and aluminium um, yeah, scrap, uh, it provides solution for the CO2 uh, reductions. Uh, as for some other uh, metal scrap uh, um, as a solution to environmental problem, uh, I would say it's uh, like uh, not that straightforward uh, based on the uh, research and based on the uh, production um, like processes of uh, these metals. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so I have already mentioned uh, that the CFD is not only about transition risk, but definitely um, uh, when we are talking about the energy transition, we have to bear in mind quite a long list of opportunities. And uh, since uh, energy transition uh, begins with mining, definitely uh, many uh, producers, um, uh, metal producers, uh, they will uh, have an age over uh, other, I would say, uh, sectors. And um, 
uh, what, what is important is that, uh, for instance, the Russian gold miner Polymetal uh, realized uh, that TCFD and climate change, it's not only about risks, uh, but it's also about opportunity. And they decided to explore uh, for copper in Russia in order to diversify uh, their current uh, resource base and their current uh, business model. Um, they are looking for uh, great exposure to a commodity uh, because of the um, uh, rising demand and because of all the trends associated with the uh, energy transition. And um, yeah, um, definitely highest level um, of uh, demand uh, and the optimism um, about uh, these uh, sectors about uh, comes from uh, US and China that support a shift to cleaner forms of uh, energy. And uh, another uh, successful story is lithium story. And uh, if we will uh, look at their report, for instance, of uh, Lazard, uh, we will see that lithium ion technologies, they will remain dominant. Uh, and at the moment, they represent approximately 90% of the market. And uh, what is also important is that it's the least costly option among others. And uh, given this intermittent nature of uh, main renewable sources, definitely storage technologies and metals that will be used to produce these technologies, they are of paramount importance uh, in uh, like uh, general. And uh, next slide, please. On the next slide, you can uh, see, uh, I would say, a list of uh, different uh, uh, risks that are associated uh, with the uh, metals and uh, mining uh, sector. Uh, we have uh, mentioned some opportunities. Uh, maybe it's also worth um, mentioning uh, a couple of uh, other transition risks. For instance, at the moment, carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, is quite a, a hot issue and uh, European Union in order to uh, reduce carbon leakage and protect European companies uh, from uh, foreign competition uh, in countries with lax uh, carbon regulation, they decided, uh, yeah, just to introduce this type of uh, mechanism. And uh, based on uh, public consultations on uh, this uh, CBAM or carbon uh, board adjustment mechanism, the tax uh, will be imposed uh, at first on electricity, uh, steel, uh, bulk chemicals, fertilizers, and uh, as we can see, steel is already in the list and um in, uh, during the uh, upcoming periods, uh, more and more, uh, I would say, producers will be added uh, to this list. And uh, maybe a few words uh, more about the physical risk. Maxim has already uh, mentioned the melting permafrost, uh, but some other risks uh, like extreme weather, weather events, uh, including rain, floods, wildfires, and also heat waves. Uh, he, uh, uh, they uh, might uh, significantly, um, I would say, um, distort uh, the operational um, uh, like uh, stage uh, of uh, the mining companies. And uh, this uh, risk affect the whole supply chain. So basically, uh, damages might arise uh, at mines and uh, at production sites, but also uh, might be might affect uh, uh, shipping uh, and transportation. Yeah, so fishing uh, of fin finished goods, sorry. And um, yeah, next slide. On the next slide, uh, you can uh, see uh, an example of Yevras. Uh, we really think that it's uh, one of the uh, best examples among Russian companies. Uh, why it is so, why we uh, do believe uh, that this example is so good is uh, because uh, they, uh, like they base their TCFD analysis on three scenarios. Uh, and I would say it's some kind of 
golden rule uh, uh, yeah, uh, to uh, start the uh, free uh, scenarios and then step-by-step um, step add some uh, new, um, I would say, new ones. And uh, what is important is that this company uh, is disclosing assumptions. Um, and uh, it's not just a black box, uh, but they are really trying to shed the light uh, on what is inside and how they create these scenarios and what variables are added. And uh, in order to explain it to, to, to the broader public, uh, the company is using a socioeconomic narrative uh, just to provide um, the content. Uh, next slide, please. What we have uh, learned uh, over uh, over uh, our projects, uh, I, I would say that many uh, companies, even if they want uh, to integrate TCFD, sometimes uh, they really uh, don't know uh, how to organize uh, the whole process. And therefore, we do believe uh, that the, this problem that we call lost in translation uh, problem uh, might be solved uh, if all the information flows are clearly defined uh, and uh, let's say um, in place board of directors uh, departments that are directly um, dealing uh, the sustainability issues uh, can uh, understand uh, how the information uh, is flowing like uh, inside uh, the, the company who is responsible for what and what kind of tools mechanisms are um, existing uh, in order to let's say discuss the problem because TCFD uh, it's uh, um, like in the climate issues uh, they are quite complex and they are required to involve uh, different uh, stakeholders both internal and external and for this purpose uh, there is a need to understand um, how to uh, deliver uh, the information uh, from one let's say decision center to another one and how to reconcile their objectives so that's uh, like of paramount importance another um, i would say problem that fall into the category of lost in translation is that uh, climate climate risk um, might be a very scientific problem uh, that uh, is not uh, clear how to address it, how, how to address this issue for people who are not aware of these scientific climate issues. And for this uh, reason, uh, there is a need uh, to um, translate, I would say, uh, climate parameters into financial terms, uh, because uh, definitely uh, banks, uh, pension funds, different institutional investors, uh, they are now the users of TCFD reports. And um, uh, in order to expedite the process of uh, TCFD penetration, in order to uh, improve the quality of reports, uh, definitely uh, this link between uh, uh, climate parameters and financial parameters uh, has to be established. Uh, next slide. And um, on the next slide, uh, you can see can you You want one with yeah, quantification yeah, so, order? Sorry. Uh, it's can on you the screen. It's gonna, sorry, it's my, it's my bad. Uh, yeah, I want uh, the one with quantification. And uh, on this slide, uh, you can see what I mean uh, by this lost in translation and that there is uh, a need to translate climate terms into financial terms. Uh, where, uh, over the course uh, of a project, if, um, carbon trust we really uh, we have managed uh, to uh, learn uh, how basically uh, climate related risks and opportunities uh, might be uh, assessed and um, you, you see that there are three main um, yeah, like steps in uh, in this methodology so first there is a need to identify climate related risk opportunity then uh, for the company it's important to prioritize 
case, all of them, because it's simply imp impossible to uh, factor into analysis all of them uh, at once. And definitely, a uh, company uh, need to uh, it needs to establish some kind of prioritization um, mechanism. And uh, the last but not least, the company has to quantify these uh, parameters. And as uh, we can uh, see. Uh, uh, on, on, on the slide, uh, the, the like uh, companies uh, and investors, uh, they can uh, use uh, the uh, element or like uh, the indicator uh, that uh, is showing uh, VAS, uh, uh, that is showing a cumulative loss creation of value uh, between, um, I would say, a set, like between a set baseline and relevant uh, time horizon and under different uh, scenarios. And uh, then uh, the, it will be compared to a business as usual view. So um, yeah, it's just uh, the procedure that is also used by uh, many other providers of uh, like uh, TCFD solutions. So first we are uh, modeling external climate parameter. Uh, we are then linking this parameter to internal value drivers just to uh, determine uh, and assess the impact uh, to value creation. And we are estimating the impact under different scenarios just to compare it to a business as a usual approach. And uh, it's important to note here uh, here uh, that um uh, that uh, quantification of uh, climate-related risk is uh, possible, yeah, because we have carbon price. Uh, it's still at the nascent stage of development, and not uh, all countries have already integrated uh, this uh, tool into the policy mix. Uh, but what is important is that it is uh, measurable, yeah. So it's possible to assign a carbon price uh, and to get this uh, value at risk risk, for instance, uh, or value at stake as in case of carbon trust methodology. But in case of some social issues, it might be uh, quite difficult and um, like uh, pose uh, a lot of uh, challenges uh, for, for the companies. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, on the next slide, uh, you can uh, see uh, that um, now uh, more and more uh, uh, institutional investors, uh, banks, uh, and other, uh, I would say, financial institutions, they are uh, joining the club uh, uh, and of entities that factor ESG into their analysis. And uh, why it is happening? So why ESG approach matters for all these, uh, I would say, financial uh, players? Um, there are many reasons, uh, but what we wanted to highlight uh, is that uh, banks, uh, they have to respond to these changes, both to transition risk and to physical risk uh, because of the uh, new regulation. Uh, they have to evaluate this, uh, uh, their credit risk exposure associated with their uh, credit portfolios. And uh, definitely they have to perform this counterparty level uh, financial analysis um, Yeah, that will uh, help them uh, to uh, assess uh, properly um, the risk and allocate uh, financing uh, to the best performing companies. Uh, I would say that on the uh, banking side, uh, there are several leaders, uh, several central banks uh, that are really uh, conducting climate stress testing. Uh, it's Bank of England and, and also uh, Dutch Central Bank. So uh, they are um, uh, working in this direction in order to evaluate the impact uh, of the climate uh, like risk on the financial uh, system in general. Uh, another, uh, I would say, uh, stakeholder um, uh, that, that is gaining weight uh, in this ESG um, 
uh, space. Uh, it's stock exchangers and uh, basically uh, our project, the Moscow Stock Exchange, uh, has uh, shown us uh, that uh, stock exchanges, they can create sustainability related sections. And by creating these sections on their stock exchanges, uh, they can attract new investors, they can um, uh, help companies uh, to uh, maybe uh, re rethink their strategy, think what kind of business uh, might fall into the category of sustainable one. And uh, what is also important that they can guide uh, the companies by uh, releasing and issuing different recommendation on ESG and uh, TCFD, for instance. Uh, there is a group uh, of sustainable stock exchanges uh, that is uh, working currently on TCFD, um, like uh, recommendations how companies uh, can integrate them. And in 2015, they worked uh, in like on uh, ESG in a broad sense. And uh, the last but not least is definitely investors. Uh, and uh, they are um, yeah, those uh, who are, I would say, uh, quite active uh, at, the, at, the, at the moment. And uh, for instance, um, in Russia, in the investors, uh, they were um, trying uh, to persuade um, Russian companies like Polymetal, Gazprom, uh, that uh, climate uh, risk, ESG risk in general, have to be addressed. And uh, yeah, so uh, I would say uh, they um, really uh, contributed a lot uh, to the development uh, of uh, green finance uh, market uh, in Russia and green finance practices among Russian companies. And, and the next slide, please. Uh, that's the last one. So um, I, I will uh, try to finalize. Uh, and uh, on this slide, you can see uh, that um, different financial institutions uh, try to integrate ESG factors into analysis by different uh, strategies. And one of the most frequently uh, used one is the so-called negative screening. Uh, it's an approach that helps you know, to exclude specific uh, classes of assets, um, it might be also like uh, companies, uh, sectors, uh, and uh, countries uh, that, let's say, uh, breach some uh, norms or standards uh, or let's say contribute to the uh, climate change. Uh, the uh, best possible example uh, might be banks that are restricting uh, fossil fuel lending to oil, uh, to oil sands and to Arctic drilling. Uh, you can uh, follow the link uh, on the slide. Uh, but that's uh, okay. This strategy helps to avoid ESG risk, but uh, the overwhelming majority of uh, companies, they are interested in um, managing uh, uh, this like positive ESG output and input. And for this purpose, uh, other strategies uh, might like uh, be um, might not, might nicely suit this purpose. Uh, in this case, we are talking about binary strategies. Uh, we are talking about um, quantitative strategies that help to measure an output, and we can talk about the monetization of uh, ESG impact. So, in case of binary strategies, uh, we are simply using some uh, labels and certifications, some norm-based screening. Uh, um, banks can, uh, let's say, uh, conduct a, a check whether a project fall into the category of uh, sustainable development goals. But in this case, we are just uh, checking uh, whether the uh, project, let's say, or company uh, is adhering to certain rules or fall into certain categories. Uh, next uh, set of strategies, this, this quanti quantitative, st uh, quantitative strategies, they really have help to evaluate uh, already the ESG 
uh, output. It might, uh, the, this assessment might be done by means of rating or by uh, means of individual KPIs. Uh, but uh, both of these uh, variants really help to, um, you know, measure the output. And the last but not least, uh, but definitely uh, the most complicated uh, strategy, um, like ESG strategy for uh, financing inst uh, institutions is this monetization of ESG impact. And a good example might be the case of IBM Amner that developed innovative financing tool that is called the Health Impact Bond uh, in order to uh, evaluate um, uh, the impact of medical programs, the uh, rehabilitation programs, uh, and uh, they, um, I would say, linked uh, this social, uh, pro uh, the value of social programs in uh, medicine uh, to their, uh, let's say, premiums and to, uh, to the uh, business of insurance companies. So that was the case. If you're interested uh, later, we can uh, enlarge on this uh, in more detail. And I think uh, at this point, I, uh, I will uh, finish and uh, over to you, Anna. Thank you very much, Olga and Maxim. Uh, this, is a, this is great. A lot of information to digest as we uh, suspected is going to be the case. And uh, I hope that uh, this was very uh, uh, valuable to all the uh, per, uh, attendees and participants. So uh, now we are going to move to uh, uh, Paris actually. And we're going to invite uh, Aksana Megle to uh, uh, have a quick presentation on what they are doing at the Societe Generale. Uh, so Oksana is uh, leading the uh, business development uh, team for uh, mining metals and uh, uh, extractive industries. Uh, and uh, she's uh, working with Societe Generale for 14 years. And uh, she's... Uh, uh, leading the uh, mining and metals uh, division uh, de uh, business development team from 2018. Uh, and uh, the, in that uh, position, uh, they were able to introduce those first in kind of uh, green uh, uh, finances, uh, uh, green project financing uh, instruments uh, to uh, different mining companies. Uh, and uh, she has a master's in international uh, risk management, and she's also uh, enrolled in the executive uh, master's uh, on the ESG and sustainability development from Paris Tech. So uh, welcome, Oksana, and uh, we're, we're, it's over to you now. Thank you very much, Anna, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, today, I would like to focus on um, three main uh, areas. The first one is uh, what are the drivers of the recent changes which we observe on the market? What are the opportunities which we see as a bank, uh, uh, let's say, collectively and uh, for our clients in mining and uh, metal industries from this trend uh, of uh, specific uh, greater focus on sustainability on, on the ESG topics? And then finally, what do the banks need to intensify this support to the industry? So on the first one, um, we have always seen that uh, the mining and metals industry has been specifically attentive to the risks which are related to the, uh, its impacts, uh, environmental and social impacts. And uh, this is really something which uh, clearly defines the, the industry compared to, to, to others. So the no notion of the risks from the from the from the environment, uh, from the changes related to the implementation of a project, it's something which which was very well managed. What is new is uh, the opportunities, and this is something which uh, which um, uh, not all the companies have uh, learned how to manage, and not uh, all the companies uh, already got organized in order to take the best out of it. 
um, what we have, uh, what have been uh, actually driving this, uh, this, uh, the emergence of these new opportunities. First of all, it's uh, the mega trends which we see uh, on, on the, well, actually globally with uh, the specific greater focus on the climate topics, on the biodiversity topics. Uh, with a specific focus to the environment, uh, with uh, countries which are launching the commitments uh, to carbon neutrality, uh, with a lot of international attention to the to the to the to the um, uh, topic, and necessarily this uh, this drives the greater attention uh, to this area and uh, to this uh, specific um, uh, specific area. Uh, there is also the awareness of the final consumers, which uh, which is on one side driving this mega trend, but on another side uh, uh, is behind this mega trend. The final consumers, not only the individuals, but also the corporates, such as uh, car makers or uh, industrial companies, uh, and uh, this uh, greater attention to the uh, to the to the way the products which they use have been made and uh, to the impact of these products on the environment, on the society, uh, to the climate. Uh, it's uh, really something which uh, has emerged very strongly recently. And uh, as, uh, as uh, Olga has uh, uh, demonstrated, the metals are really at the beginning of the value chain and uh, the <laughs> The, the, the attention to these topics uh, has uh, uh, has been uh, uh, well has arrived also to the final producers of the uh, of the of the metals. So uh, this is something which is uh, very important to keep in mind and which we really see as a strong emerging emerging uh, uh, tendency in the discussion with our clients. We see that uh, the ESG topics topics is uh, something which um, which comes up comes up at the strategic level from downstream industry and upstream industries. Then there is also the regulatory uh, pressure, which was uh, nicely described by Olga, uh, starting from the commitments of the governments to the uh, EU climate law, to the uh, EU taxonomy, uh, which has been uh, made public recently. Uh, also the uh, carbon border adjustment uh, mechanism uh, for, for which the final uh, draft is going to be uh, known uh, shortly. So all this, uh, uh, and I don't uh, mention the different initiatives in other countries, but uh, Europe has been uh, really leading this. So this puts additional pressure on, uh, on everyone. And uh, then there are also the investors uh, which are trying to, uh, we, which have switched actually what we see the trend, that the trend which we observe is the investors are switching from uh, who, who, who is the, the best student to who is the best in the class and how to identify this best in the class. And uh, do we want to support uh, uh, the, we want to support the best in, in the class because we see the difference in the performance. Uh, and uh, the bank, the, 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 the banks uh, have been also uh, uh, necessarily uh, connected to the recent changes. Uh, Olga mentioned that uh, the, the, the banks uh, have recently started to pay attention to the global ESG analysis of the uh, company's performance. In fact, uh, at Societe Generale, this is something which we have been doing already and uh, the global uh, assessment of the e ENS risks, it was a part of the analysis uh, since uh, I would say more than 10 years or maybe even more. But uh, the greater focus on the climate topics, this is something new. Uh, and uh, this is something which uh, has been driven by all these mega trends and uh, by the regula re regula uh, regulatory requirements. Um, uh, banks have been taken commitments uh, to align their portfolio with uh, the um, with the Paris uh, uh, Paris Agreement. For instance, Societe Generale has uh, uh, we have joined the 
the the group of banks uh, which is called Net Zero Banking Alliance, which has committed to align uh, its portfolio in selected uh, industries um, in line with uh, the commitments of Paris Agreement. So this is uh, something which now will drive the behavior of those banks who have committed to uh, to support this group and who have taken these uh, commitments. Uh, in another recent example from the in the, from the banking industry is uh, a newly formed group on the climate aligned finance, uh, in particular in the steel and the Societe Generale has been co-leading this group uh, where the um, the, the, the group, uh, there, is a, there are six uh, banks in the working group together with uh, the industry and with some think tanks, uh, uh, RMI, Rocky Mountain Institute, have uh, joined the forces in order to work uh, on the definition of the, um, of the trajectory for the steel industry uh, to have a clear KPIs uh, for the for the climate uh, for the for the CO, for the greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, um, reduction, so uh, the alignment commitments plus uh, the participation in the uh, work group, which uh, which set itself a target to define the trajectory of the greenhouse gas emission reductions, that will lead to the fact that the banks will naturally look for those. Uh, projects and clients with a lower footprint uh, and we'll be looking uh, to support those who have the decarbonization strategies, clear strategies, but we'll also look at uh, other factors, other ESG factors, um, uh, such as uh, the impact uh, on the biodiversity and uh, uh, water, air, um, uh, societal subjects as well, the governance, uh, the banks will be looking more and more at uh, uh, such areas as um, uh, clear, uh, clear ESG governance within the group. So all this is driving the uh, emergence of new opportunities for the mining and metals companies because the financial institutions will be looking for to support such uh, uh, such projects. And uh, how has it been materialized? These new opportunities. It's um, well on one side. Uh, th there are several things. The, the first one, I would say that uh, this is everything related to the sustainability and green. Uh, financing any form of uh, sustainability linked uh, loans uh, and uh, green loans and there are also bonds which uh, where the banks uh, play an important role in, uh, in in being a link between the investors and the corporates but uh, on the financing side uh, the sustainability linked loans uh, and green loans have uh, uh, have been uh, really growing rapidly. The volume of these transactions uh, have been uh, um, more than doubling between 2009, 20, and even the beginning of the year. Uh, we see that uh, there is really big appetite for this uh, type of transactions from uh, various uh, industries. But it's uh, it's a uh, it's a strong trend in. Uh, uh, in metals and mining, we see, for instance, uh, well, on Societe Generale side, we have been uh, ourselves leading um, a conversion of uh, uh, Metallo Invest uh, facility into a sustainability link loan at the end of December. We have been working together with uh, Polymetal on, on the uh, 2019 sustainability link loan, which was linked to ENS KPIs. We have been also working with uh, um, Polymetal on the first green loan. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a really a strong trend and not only in Europe. Now we see that the, there are other uh, continents which uh, pick up the, 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 this uh, trend. Uh, there have been recently transaction for a large gold company in the US. Uh, uh, we see that there are uh, certain uh, transactions um, uh, in Asia as well. So it's picking up everywhere. Um, uh, in, another trend, uh, which uh, another opportunity which arises, it's uh, uh, great availability of funds for financing of the projects related to decarbonization, uh, which is 
well, actually, it's a topic which is relevant for any metal uh, producing company because uh, because of because the climate is such a big uh, elephant in the room. Uh, we, we see that uh, polymetal, for example, in terms of their decarbonization strategy, which was financed uh, through the green loan, the topics which they have uh, selected, um, it was uh, the replacement of, uh, of the vehicles by the electric vehicles, uh, great elect electrification, the programs which were related to the um, uh, to, to, to the renewable energy. And uh, this is a trend uh, which uh, can be uh, replicated in many, ma many companies will recognize their own uh, uh, policies and own strategies. Uh, we also see such uh, projects, uh, such projects in the steel industry and the aluminum industry. And uh, we see, for instance, uh, Societe Generale has been working, uh, has been appointed as a financial advisor for the first uh, uh, fossil-free steel project uh, in Europe, uh, which is called the uh, H2 Green Steel. Uh, it's, a, it's a project which uh, will combine the construction of electro an electrolyzer with uh, the steel uh, mill. Uh, so fossil free uh, steel mill. Uh, so, so, so uh, and the, the topic of the decarbonization is on the on top of the agendas of uh, uh, of um, metal producers. So how can we capitalize on that? How how can how, what the, what can the industry do to support uh, to actually to help the banks to support. Uh, uh, such initiatives is, uh, first of all, mentioned, uh, described very nicely by Olga, to have a clearly clear communication, to, to collect the information internally, to identify who has the information, to, uh, to assess it internally, what has been already done, what's, uh, what's currently being done, uh, what can you... Uh, what can you present to the market? Present to the market, um, work with, uh, uh, well, if needed, with appropriate consultants in order to uh, uh, communicate clearly what, what is already being done. Because really, we see that our clients, we discuss with them, they say, but we, we do all these things internally, we just don't communicate on them. But because you don't communicate on them, it, uh, it can penalize you because um, the ESG rating agencies who might uh, be giving the unsolicited uh, rating, they are looking at these um, uh, reports which, which, uh, which the company has uh, based, on the, so based on the public information. If it's not complete, then the score will be lower than a peer, even though the company does everything what's uh, required and goes beyond that. Um, uh, the banks would be looking at that and will be asking you questions. Uh, your investors will be asking questions, uh, your stakeholders might not have the information and uh, it's also the way to attract the best talents, to retain the employees, uh, to, well, maybe to communicate with other stakeholders which you have identified. So this is the, the, re the communication, the reporting, it's really very, very important for us. Um, then uh, another area which, uh, which is very, um, well, which probably can unblock a lot of things is uh, to be able to uh, identify and then quantify the risks and action plan related to the ENS topics and especially to the climate programs uh, in order to uh, start mobilizing the support of your, of your financial stakeholders, of your financial partners behind such projects. Um, uh, clearly address climate topics. Uh, uh, this is, uh, th the banks will come to you and uh, they will ask uh, more and more, what, uh, what are you doing on that? Uh, investors will come to you, uh, communicate, uh, with a benchmark because it uh, helps to uh, clearly position the company and the efforts which uh, which it is doing. It's uh, not an easy task because uh, for some of the industries there are no clear benchmark. There are actually no um, common trajectory for the industries. Uh, this, that's why actually the this uh, this uh, climate aligned finance for steel has been launched because. Uh, 
the, the, the banks, uh, the, the, the community needs uh, this uh, common, commonly agreed trajectory in order to position the, um, the companies. And uh, I would say that um, all, all this could really uh, could be beneficial in terms of uh, uh, in terms of on one side uh, bringing your partners on board and then on another side uh, uh, making sure that uh, uh, those in, uh, those stakeholders who use the publicly available information they also uh, well give the ratings to you uh, evaluate uh, yourself uh, as uh, uh, to, let's say to the to, to the to the best of uh, what's being actually done within the company. So with this, I pass the word back to Anna. Okay, thank you very much, Oksana. Uh, another great insight and great perspective from a, a, a banking uh, perspective and from the bank that is uh, already doing uh, all these. Uh, uh, green finance and uh, sustainability linked uh, financial uh, activities. Uh, this is uh, very interesting. Uh, so now at this time, we are going to uh, have a, a small uh, uh, panel discussion uh, about 30 minutes. And uh, at this point, I will invite all our speakers and uh, Miranda were still uh, to uh, uh, join uh, and uh, maybe uh, like activate your uh, cameras so we can see you. Uh, so Maxim Zitov, Olga Ziplova, Aksana uh, Migle and uh, Miranda were still. And maybe I will just give a quick introduction to Miranda. Um, and uh, so uh, Miranda is a, a accomplished uh, finance and uh, investment banking professional, and she works across all uh, like all uh, parts of the financial uh, transactions value chain. And uh, her thought leadership and expertise in the industry uh, challenges like ESG requirements, working with local governments and indigenous communities is. Uh, uh, very valuable and sought after. And uh, so she's right now uh, leading the corporate development team for the OCIM Precious Metals uh, uh, private uh, family investment uh, uh, institution. And uh, we're just uh, going to start uh, the panel uh, discussion. And uh, the first question I will address to Maxim. Uh, so uh, I uh, was uh, even a bit, like from our offline discussions, uh, I was very interested when you mentioned about the Arctic Pan uh, Council and uh, uh, I was wondering, so how do you see the collaboration between Russia and Canada, especially from the perspective of working and uh, living with indigenous communities? Uh, that will be interesting to learn, uh, hear from you, Maxim. Well, I uh, from, from from my professional experience, I was uh, studying the some uh, public reports of uh, big Russian oil and gas companies, in particular Novatek, uh, Yamal LNG project, and uh, such companies. They pay a lot of attention to uh, IFC performance standards, namely the the standard about indigenous peoples, and uh, they describe. Uh, uh, in details, the process of communicating uh, with indigenous population and uh, what the company is doing in order to engage indigenous populations when they start some exploration and mining and some other activities in the, uh, in, the, in the Arctic zone. And uh, uh, so, so this was one, one, one uh, observation that companies that are working with uh, international investment communities, they are under the pressure to go much beyond the national legislation. Uh, they have to comply with uh, IFC, in particular with IFC performance standards, which uh, has uh, more uh, recommendations and, and more uh, advices on how to establish the dialogue with indigenous peoples in particular. And the uh, second point is when I attended uh, 
conference of parties, the, the UN conference on climate change. I, I visited it twice in Bonn and in Katowice, COP23 and COP24. I saw the delegation from indigenous peoples of Russia was very active there. They mm -hmm. came with the music, with traditional costumes. Say they get a lot of attention from the general public, from the media, and they can talk and they can express their experience of uh, working in this changing climate, changing conditions. And uh, I think if uh, uh, they have more contacts, indigenous populations from different continents, they can do more. They can get even more attention from uh, political leaders, from big companies, from uh, business community, uh, and, and from, from the climate community. From one side, from another side, uh, companies that are working in the Arctic zone, they also have to learn experience of their peers. If uh, Novatec did something well, did some recognition for this, uh, why Canadian companies will not Will, will ignore this uh, this experience and vice versa. We should uh, probably study the experience of Canadian companies in terms of respecting rights of, of indigenous populations and apply some best practices to Russian companies. Okay, no, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I think like before uh, asking a uh, next question to Olga, I am going to just, uh, run a poll uh, and uh, the see just one second <clears throat> so uh, something went wrong with my poll so it was it, it looks like it was running already and i see the results uh, on the screen already and i hope that you can also see it uh, so just one second so it was about the metals that uh, are going to have the biggest potential for the producers in the next five years and which metals are going to have the highest demand. Um, so, uh, and uh, the obvious uh, um, winner is copper, interestingly enough, and then the next is lithium and then nickel. That's interesting. So uh, with that, um, I am going to uh, just uh, get on the next uh, question. Uh, sorry. So, uh, and the next question goes to Olga. So uh, it's uh, from that uh, uh, energy transition uh, perspective. And we mentioned that, uh, so it starts with the mining industry. So. What, uh, what do you think are the factors that are uh, posing the biggest threat to energy transition over the next five years, Olga? Um, yeah, so uh, definitely um, there will be many um, challenges uh, in the upcoming years, but uh, I would say mining sector uh, has um, you know to reconcile uh, two objectives on uh, one hand mining sector has to help uh, to different uh, stakeholders you know to um, execute this energy transition by producing uh, necessary uh, metals and materials uh, but on the other hand uh, they have to uh, substantially reduce uh, their emissions associated with uh, let's say with their sector as a whole and uh, they should uh, like do that um, just to stay competitive, to uh, adhere to the new emerging regulation and so on and so forth. It means that they have to mobilize financing and a lot of uh, financing. Um, given uh, some perception that mining is a dirty uh, industry, uh, many companies uh, that are not proactive in the area of ESG uh, might encounter, the, I would say, some um, not 
problems but uh, limitations uh, when it comes to uh, finan uh, like new financing uh, sources. Uh, for this reason, uh, we think uh, and the, yeah, the center that um, there is a need uh, to unlock um, of different forms of financing, uh, namely transition financing, and um, some steps has already been undertaken. Uh, for instance, um, like London Stock Exchange opened a sector uh, that is uh, like dealing uh, with transition bonds. Uh, ICMA, uh, in the, uh, I think at the end of last year, uh, released uh, recommendations uh, how to um, like help companies uh, from the, uh, I would say, not uh, uh, very easy to abate sectors uh, to um, raise financing uh, to make their business greener. Yeah, and definitely uh, one of, yeah, just to s summing up, one of the main uh, problems uh, is to um, um, I would say reconcile uh, the objectives uh, of the uh, energy transition and the objectives of raising finance for this purpose. So that's uh, of paramount importance. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Olga. Thank you. And uh, I think we'll move to Oksana. And uh, I was very interested in, uh, uh, you mentioned a couple of times about sustainability linked loans and KPI linked loans interchangeably a couple of times. So I am, I'm sure like uh, other members of our audience are interested as well. And uh, there is a little bit of a confusion. What are the differences between the KPI, like a specific KPI linked uh, loans and uh, rating based loans. So if you just give us a, a quick overview, that will be great. Yes. So for the sustainability linked loans, uh, currently on the market, uh, there are two main types of uh, products. The one which is, uh, which we can, which very often is referred to as ESG linked loan. It's the one which is linked to, the, to an ESG rating uh, of the company. So in such case, uh, the performance, the financial performance uh, of the loan is linked to the performance uh, of the uh, score of the ESG rating uh, measured on an annual basis. Uh, uh, the, the main idea is to make sure that uh, the company improves in, uh, in those areas which will lagging the score behind uh, uh, and uh, generally improves on all three ESG uh, areas. Uh, if we talk about the sustainability linked loans uh, in uh, very often, it's, uh, really, it, it's related to the own sustainability program of the company and its own uh, environmental and social um, targets and objectives, uh, which the company uh, needs to define. And uh, the banks uh, work together with the company to define those KPIs, which are the most relevant to be included in the sustainability linked loans. Very often we see that uh, uh, there is a climate KPI. It's almost like a must uh, to have one of the KPIs um, uh, in one form or another related to the climate area. And then for the other types of uh, objectives, uh, targets, KPIs, uh, which are chosen for the industry, very often uh, it's uh, related to the environment, uh, uh, what, the level of, uh, for instance, uh, recyclability in the water, uh, air emissions, um, uh, anything around uh, biodiversity, but it's also about social aspects, uh, accidents, uh, various certifications uh, which exist. Uh, we have actually recently seen a transaction on the market where the KPI was linked uh, to the certification from an industry association, from steel, uh, uh, steel industry association. So it's, um, it's really linked to the specific strategy of the company. And uh, recently uh, we have seen that uh, one quarter of the loans was related to the ESG rating and uh, over 75% was uh, KPI linked loans. So it's, um, we see that uh, this product is uh, recently have been more popular. Oh, interesting. 
interesting to know that uh, the uh, weight is on the uh, own KPIs uh, uh, rather than uh, external ratings. That's uh, very good to know, actually. Uh, thank you very much, Oksana. And uh, I think like now uh, we will move to uh, Miranda. And uh, we uh, asked Miranda to uh, come and join us uh, because uh, recently they were in, like OCI, OCIM, uh, Precious Metals, was involved in a very interesting uh, transactions uh, that are uh, against sustainability and ESG link. So, I will uh, actually ask uh, Miranda to uh, uh, tell us about the, the sustainability uh, group that uh, she's working with right now and what are the projects that, uh, what are those signature projects that uh, they worked on and they are currently working on. Thank you. Welcome, Emma. Miranda. Thank you, thank you. Um, first of all, Maxime, Olga, and Oksana, um, it's a pleasure to meet you and thank you for your um, intelligence, uh, insight, understanding, and articulation of what's going on uh, globally as it relates to sort of broadly the extractive industry. Um, certainly, there's when I started 27 years ago, we it was a very different place, <laughs> uh, and the evolution that we've we've seen, um, you know, whether it's incrementally or in, in leaps and bounds, sometimes is 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 quite amazing. And the transformation in the industry, because I think 25 years ago we wouldn't we wouldn't be sitting here talking about about biodiversity and 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 climate change and impact and and uh, sustainability linked loans. I mean that was, it was a very different world. Uh, so to see the the transformation is 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 quite amazing. We have a lot of work to do yet, uh, but you know step by step I think we're we're moving forward. Uh, you know, I come at the mining industry from a kind of a, a unique background as a biologist and anthropologist. Uh, so uh, I am now working with um, Osim Precious Metals, which is effectively is a metals trading business uh, in Geneva that has been seeded uh, by a, 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 a French family. Um, and, and really the, the vision of Osim is to be able to identify, um, let's say, smaller off-market transactions where where we can deploy loans and we're, we're lending money to be repaid in the physical commodity. And essentially it's for, for bursts of working capital. Uh, and so we, we have spent uh, time, my colleagues and I, looking at where we can best deploy this capital um, and what kind of impact uh, does this, uh, this capital have. Uh, and so uh, there's two transactions. Uh, actually, we've completed three in the last two months, but um, I'm going to just highlight two. Um, one was for a public company called uh, Inca One, uh, which is a, a Canadian public company that uh, has um, ore processing operations in Peru. And what they do is they source the material from uh, small scale uh, miners. And, and Peru has, a, has been on, on a path of formalizing its small scale mining industry. So we, we looked at how we could how would our capital, first of all, impact the business and, and, and then impact uh, those small scale operations. And it ties into the work I'm doing with the Planet Gold Initiative on, that's linked to the Minamata Convention and the reduction of mercury uses, particularly in, in artisanal scale gold mining. So we wanted to understand um, capital going in, uh, how does it flow to those small scale miners? What is the, 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 the ripple effect on those communities? On, on the stakeholders, on the environment. Uh, so, you know, through the process of our due diligence, um, we could see uh, how we would, we would transform not only the business, but people's lives. Uh, and the second one is a company called uh, Guanajuato Silver, which is again, is a public company uh, with an operation in Mexico. And uh, we went through our process, uh, uh, money has gone out, and, and really to, to see not only the, the, the evolution of a, of a producing uh, uh, mind, so moving back into production, uh, but also, you know, speaking to the CEO and the team in Mexico, that it's not just, you know, the, the, the operational, but it is the, it is the, as he put it, the, the, the taxi drivers, the, 
the restaurants, the, the broader community, the people working on site. So the, 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 uh, the impact that even our small amount of money <laughs> going into these operations, um, you, you can add, there, there's a tangible, a tangible ripple effect. Um, and it would seem is, is very um, conscious and aware, uh, you know, if you speak to our principal about, you know, initially the, the Millennium Development Goals and now the 17 SDGs, uh, and you look at, you know, ICMM's uh, research that, that mining has an impact on every single one of those SDGs. And, and so for us as a small, a small lending group, uh, how, how can we have impact? And, and, and then, I mean, that ties into the sort of broader sustainability dis uh, discussion. So for us, uh, you know, we, we're, we're, we're small, but we, we, we're always looking to partner. Um, we're looking at where, where we can add the greatest value and have the greatest impact. Yeah, no, thank you very much, uh, Miranda, that's great. And uh, I have one more question uh, to you actually, especially because uh, it's a, a relatively new concept of uh, integrating ESG uh, in the mining in terms of monetizing and in terms of uh, putting some uh, tangible uh, result uh, next to it. So it will be interesting like, to understand a little bit uh, more. So how do you, what are the possibilities to internalize those external factors related to environmental and social? And uh, how you uh, integrate uh, those two uh, factors uh, into your uh, project evaluation of when you do uh, like review of your pipeline? Right. So, so I mean, and I think everyone has alluded, uh, you know, discussed this today that that going forward, um, you know, projects will not uh, succeed unless you you understand all the stakeholders, you understand the communities, the environment, um, the local indigenous uh, uh, people, the, uh, you know, archaeology. I mean, there's so many, so many impact points of a mining operation from start to finish that, mm -hmm. that if we as investors um, don't take a holistic uh, look at, at all those pieces, then those projects it just won't succeed. And, and if we don't understand, you know, we, we need to understand the risks as well. So, you know, when we're, when we're evaluating projects, you know, how do we, you know, what are the risks? How do we mitigate them? Um, you know, what is the impact of this operation? Um, uh, there's so many, so many, you know, if you draw a stakeholder map, there's so many inputs into that mm -hmm. operation that you, you know, for us, we, even though it's a it's a small amount of money, we really need to understand the the ebb and flow. So you know we spend we spend time you know with the management teams. We we have technical uh, legal due diligence on the ground, um, uh, technical and that looks at environmental permitting communities. Uh, uh, so you know we we are trying. You know we are 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 very aware and very conscious of of how to pull that assessment into our invest or to our investment decision okay no thank you thank you very much yeah that's a, a, a difficult concept uh, and it is uh, one of the uh, topics that uh, i'm also like very interested in exploring more uh, because most of those uh, environmental and social criteria are staying like still qualitative and uh, like yes so to uh, make them tangible, more tangible, and uh, like uh, explainable to a broader public, to investors, to other stakeholders. That's something that uh, is uh, coming more and more. And I was really uh, happy to see that, uh, for example, uh, Olga and Maxim mentioned about value at stake and that quantification, yes. but that was also interesting to see and uh, would be glad to learn more about those quantification methodologies and uh, framework. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, so thank you. And uh, so Olga and Maxim, do you have anything else to uh, uh, add maybe to, uh, especially from that uh, quantification perspective, uh, do you have any additional comments? Uh, 
um, um, I would say that um, many uh, forces have to converge in order to um, uh, enable this quantification of ESG factors. I mean, the um, translation into financial terms and I would say a good example uh, of such uh, forces that converge and basically can come up with a great decision uh, it was uh, this case this ABN AMRO uh, in the Netherlands uh, because um, the medical center uh, doctors uh, the bank uh, different uh, NGO uh, and uh, university uh, they uh, all together, um, I would say, put their effort in order to create this health impact bond. And uh, it's, I would say, uh, an example uh, of the uh, most sophisticated and the most uh, complex way uh, of um, quantification of ESG factors. Yeah, so when we really try to evaluate uh, to uh, quantify uh, the impact yeah, of uh, ESG in this particular case of social uh, factor. And um, I would say uh, for uh, the ESG uh, area just to propel uh, this topic, uh, definitely uh, more efforts uh, have to be uh, put together and uh, you know just to deliver uh, so badly needed solutions in the area of uh, uh, um, like uh, environment uh, or so like in the area of social problems so uh, yeah that, that's my point yeah no thank you thank you very much Olga for that additional insight uh, and uh, what about Oksana because uh, I know that uh, I uh, had that discussion with you as well uh, from the evaluation from a loan evaluation perspective like do you have your own methodology uh, in terms of uh, like uh, monetizing those uh, ESG factors? Um, I, I think this is uh, something where uh, it's an ongoing process. It's, uh, it's something which uh, we have started uh, some time ago and uh, obviously with the, the growing uh, importance of the uh, of the sustainability linked and green loans uh, in our portfolio, we have been uh, working on this. Uh, this is also something related to the fact that Societe Generale is the bank which is clearly supporting the energy transition. We have committed uh, we have committed uh, significant amounts uh, to this uh, topic, and uh, uh, obviously the bank uh, does everything to support uh, this uh, um, uh, specific initiative. So this is uh, this is a work in progress. It's not uh, something which we uh, uh, which we uh, let's say publicly announce. But uh, given all of the trends, all of the commitments which uh, Societe General is taking, I think um, uh, everything goes in 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 this direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you very much, uh, Aksana. And uh, I think we're coming to the top of our hour. Uh, and uh, we're going to uh, like uh, finish our uh, webinar by uh, thanking uh, all our panelists uh, and speakers. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Maxim, Olga, Aksana, Miranda, for taking time from your busy schedules and joining us. and sharing your uh, expertise, uh, knowledge, and uh, uh, intelligence. Uh, so this is greatly appreciated uh, on behalf of Artemis Project. Uh, I hope that this is our first but not last uh, joint webinar together, and we'll have some other collaboration opportunities. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.